Hey, we'd like to take a minute to thank our sponsor, Isotope, makers of software and plugins for audio repair, mixing, and mastering. We use Isotope products here at the High Gain. It's an important part of how we've been able to bottle pure podcast gold week after week. And guess what? Isotope offers one free month of Music Production Suite Pro, which has all the tools you need to mix, master, and repair audio. Also, you can get 10% off all other software using the promo code FRET10. That's F-R-E-T-1-0. All of this is at isotope.com, I-Z-O-T-O-P-E dot com. Hey, this is Ed Peterson. And this is John Kiltica, Ed. I'm going to try and modulate my voice this week, John. Stay mellow. While you do get excited. I like that some weeks we talk about guitars, and some weeks we talk about basses. Yes. And this week, maybe we should talk about both. Yes, in one instrument. Oh, even better. We're going to need a guide for this. Yeah, yeah. Wouldn't you say? I think so. Did you see I'm wearing my beautiful West Seattle hat? That's where we are. We are in beautiful West Seattle. And guess what? What? We have more daylight today. I'm always stoked when the clock just switches and I don't know it's coming. This is going to be super great, Ed. Okay. We've got a new pedal that's not even released yet we're going to talk about today. Okay. We've got an instrument with two necks on it, twice the guitarage. Right. And yeah, we have a guest. Oh my gosh, a guest? Yeah. Do you know about couch riffs? You've seen couch riffs. I'm familiar with the internet. Our man Mike Squires on the web box. He's actually here. Mike. Mike. Hi, guys. How'd we do on that intro? That was awesome. If you've listened to any of the episodes where we have guests, you'll notice that Ed Peterson does this constant thing of asking for validation (laughs) mid-interview. And so I'm going to be asking you a lot how I'm doing, because, you know, I need it. I need the feedback. Is that cool? You don't need it. You're doing great, always. (laughs) Constant vibe check-in is what we're doing over here. Yeah. So. Mike, where are you? I am in Stuyvesant Falls, New York. Although... West Seattle was the first and last place I lived in Seattle. Oh. Oh. What took you out to New York? I married a New York gal. That'll do it. She wasn't going to leave. Cool. Hudson Valley, is that where you are? Yeah. We're about two and a half hours north of the city by vehicle, two hours by train. It's very nice up there. It's cold. It snowed yesterday. Dumped snow. Of course, it's going to be 60 tomorrow. That's fun. I keep you guessing. We don't get a lot of that here. We'll get an inch of snow and you're locked in for weeks. I remember that. (laughs) Beverages. Uh, Beverages, Ed. Guitar and bass. Mike Squires, do you have a beverage? I have two beverages. Ooh, double fisted, Ed. Love it. Yeah. The two banger, we call that. You know, I listen to the podcast, so I know how to do this. Oh. You know, I didn't juice or anything today, but we have a juicer. Oh my gosh, you actually do listen. <laughs> yeah, of course. Oh my gosh. I'm a subscribing listener. Get this man a tote bag. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you guys have merch? We have shirts. Tell me where to buy one. I'd love to support the arts. You don't have to because all our guests get a lovely t-shirt are you kidding me i am not kidding you so if you're out there listening and you want to be a guest if you want a t-shirt come on the show (laughs) i have a good old-fashioned glass of ro water reverse osmosis we live way out in the boonies so we're on well water so i got emergency raspberry flavor and i put two in there what does that mean reverse osmosis There's a filtering system and it goes through a membrane and then basically strips bad stuff and then puts in some good stuff. I don't remember anything from high school, really. And for whatever reason, (laughs) I remember that the definition of osmosis is the movement of a liquid through a semi-permeable membrane. That's a funny thing to remember. I don't know why, but reverse osmosis, next level. Probably better. Yeah. The other beverage... Yeah. Oh. You like that? I love it. This is a can of iced coffee. Great. Made by Crosscut. Don't know about them. Locally made. It is so locally made, in fact, I make it. (laughs) What? What? Yeah, that's right. I make this. That's your day job? That's my job, yeah. 
I make iced coffee and we can it. Really? It's a handsome can, red, white, and blue. I designed it. It looks like an old 50s beer can. Oh. And Crosscut was the name of a tavern in the town Granite Falls where I grew up. In Washington. Little logging town. Yeah. Hell yeah. The Crosscut Tavern, my mom worked there for a while. Your Instagram is getting blown up right now by Ed Peterson. Yeah. <laughs> that picture of the can next to the river. Oh. That river is 200 yards from where I sit right now. There's like a factory with cans. We, we didn't even know this. I don't own that factory for the record. It's usually not later into the episode before we find out how shoddy our research is, but uh, but that that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this feels like a thing we should have known heading in. Who would have known? But it's delicious. I make it, so I have to make it so that I enjoy it, and then hopefully other people do too, and so far people do. Would you have a problem, Mike, if we don't even bother talking about guitars or music and we just stay on this coffee thing? <laughs> I thought I had music questions, but it turns out I only have questions about maple nitro coffee. It's really delicious. Yeah, we use local maple syrup. That's not really a thing I think we can get in beautiful I West think Seattle. Mike probably goes into his backyard and just taps a tree. Has a bucket, yeah. yeah. I just yell and the tree leans over and pours it into my <laughs> pancakes or my waffles. Yeah. I have an actual smoothie. Frozen blackberries, frozen raspberries, frozen blueberries... Throw those into a blender with some almond milk and protein powder. I can endorse the color of it. It looks neither kind of fecal or overtly <laughs> plant-like. You forego the banana in your smoothie. I did today. Right before I walked down, I threw a couple of pieces of bread into the oven and then threw some peanut butter on that and then cut up a banana and had peanut butter banana toast. Way to go, Elvis. Exactly. Yeah. Died on the shitter. R.I.P. Elvis. R.I.P. Elvis. <laughs> and a coffee. What about you, John? I also have coffee because you got to have coffee. Yep. But I am sticking with the Orca beverages today. I've got the old cock and bowl. One of our personal favorites. <laughs> the extra ginger soft drink. It has plenty of bite to it. It's delicious. Man. Ed, do you know what Mike does? Makes coffee. Yes, but he's multifaceted. Okay. He has a podcast and a video podcast what are the kids calling it <laughs> video series i don't know video show our viewers are certainly aware of couch riffs that's been going for three years okay started just before we moved up here and started doing it on my couch in my apartment in brooklyn and of course when you move two and a half hours away from the city it becomes a lot more difficult right to get people to show up even if you live near a waterfall as it turns out. Yeah, drive two and a half hours for a 14-minute episode. Right. Hey, Joe Bonamassa, want to see a waterfall? Yeah. He didn't care. So it's kind of turned into pretty exclusively covers. It didn't start exactly that way, right? Well, it started with just me sitting on the couch by myself, playing along to my record collection. And then I started having guests. They were always covers. But eventually the pandemic and the quarantine videos started happening yeah. and I jumped right in. Yeah. And I've been pretty, I guess, prolific when I look. I have 70 videos that I've made. Jeez. Can you believe that? That's pretty great. I think it's great to look at the variety when I go onto YouTube. I can see a pandemic video like a cover with multiple musicians or I could watch you interviewing somebody. Or I could go back to the old ones where you guys are all smushed onto a couch live. Right. There's lots of great content. It's pretty fun. Cranking out the content, Mike. <laughs> I love it. It's weird because it's because of the pandemic that you went remote. But they feel like a step up in a weird way. The production went way up. Well, after making so many of these things, I have gotten better at it. But also, once I started... A Patreon, I was able to pay someone to mix the audio for me, so it sounds better. Yeah. A bit of behind-the-scenes magic that I've learned is that a visual can help the audio. Something can sound terrible, but if it looks cool, people will just sort of in real time immediately forgive that. That's 100%, I think, what resonates with me with the remote thing. You're not just on the couch, real time, one camera set static on you. Right. You're cutting in between the people, and they're just much more dynamic. My editing has definitely gotten 
faster. Anyone who's a learned video editor would probably cringe if they saw how I make the videos. It's so hard. The end product I'm happy about, and I just hope that I can continue getting better at it. Do you have like a list of songs in your brain mapped out? I'm building between 10 and 15 videos at any given time. Whoa. Really? I have 10 or maybe even 12 running projects right now as we speak. I have one video banked that I'll put out the week after next because I just put one out last week. I'm trying to be on an every other week schedule right now so that it's more consistent. Yeah. There must be one of those laws, you know, the law of such and such that will just tell you, oh yeah, if you have 20 projects, they'll all finish the same week. It's maddening. In the past, how it's worked out is I'll finish four videos and I'll boom, 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 put them all out one week after the next, and then I won't get another one finished for a month. It makes me feel badly. Even though I'm working hard and busting my ass, I feel like I'm not giving my Patreon supporters what they deserve. Right. So I feel like, all right, every other week, even if I'm sitting on one. Old John is going to be on one here pretty soon. Oh my God. Can you believe it? Did you know that, Ed? I did. I'm just interested in how it works in the pandemic ones with multiple people. Do you click track them and send a rough guitar line for the people to listen to? I build them one part at a time. So always start with drums. Okay. Just so that the rhythm section can be locked in. Mm -hmm. Then bass. And then after that, it gets a little more loose. But typically, I will only have one person work on it at a time. That takes a while to get through because everyone's schedule is different. Yep. It's like, all right, I'm free this week, but the bass isn't done. So I'm not free for another three weeks. Right. I guess that helps having 12 in progress at any given time. That was what inspired me to do that. But like I said, <laughs> they don't pace out like you think they would. For sure. <coughs> oh, my God. I have like berry business in my throat. Those are the antioxidants working. Swig some coffee over there. <clears throat> yeah, I'm dying. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing, Ed? I went upstairs and got some water. I'm doing way better. Well, Ed, while you were up there coughing out a lung, mm -hmm. I was telling Mike about this pedal from yeah. Dan DeMay. We would like to tell the viewers about Spun Loud Effects and Dan's upcoming pedal called the Shook Sand Fuzz. Apparently, Shook Sand is a mountain near Mount Baker in Washington State, just a stone's throw south of the Canadian border up there. Whatcom County? Yeah. North Cascades National Park. Oh. oh. Did you know that? No. I looked it up on Wikipedia. This thing has three stages of gain, which I find sort of interesting. It's oh, a lovely man. blue pedal with a picture of Shooksand Mountain on it. That seems to be as unfuzzy as it gets. Turn everything down and this is minimal fuzz fuzzage. It only has three knobs. One is an input. Yeah, yeah. It's as if you're using the volume knob on your guitar. Sure. Only it's on the pedal. I would imagine if you combine the pedal with the volume on the guitar, you can get a ton of variation. But I'm one of those dumbasses who just turns the volume up to 10 and leaves it on my guitar. Absolutely, yeah. A sustain knob and a volume knob. So if I turn up the input... Yeah. Input is at about 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock, okay. The next knob is the sustain knob. I wonder what happens if I turn that up. Give me some chug. Sure. That's pretty good. Yeah. Why don't we just jack this thing and see what happens? Because, <laughs> you know. Sure. You know what we need to go through this thing? A bass. What do you think of that, Mike Squires? I think that there's nothing more glorious than a fuzz bass. I think so. Yeah, exactly. The funny thing with this episode so far, we have not even mentioned what you're holding, have we? <laughs> I suppose we should. Yeah. Let's rewind back in time okay. to the advent 
of the barcode. Okay. Does anybody know when the barcode was first introduced? Mid to late 70s, because that's when they started going on records. Oh, nice. Ooh. Nice. But before that, the early Beatles, Elvis, all those records, no barcodes. It was the Wild West, Ed. I didn't know that. This is 1974 I'm talking about. Richard Nixon, at the same time, was refusing to hand over the Watergate tapes. Tricky Dick. What's he up to? <laughs> mm. R.I.P. Yeah, R.I.P. Dick. Okay, 1974, this is an Ibanez 2404, 2404. They only made it for three years. This is the middle of the lawsuit era, a term that's kind of thrown around a lot for a lot of different brands and a lot of different guitars. But to be clear, the lawsuit was Gibson against Ibanez. Right. I dug up some really fun facts about the lawsuit and how Ibanez just kind of yanked Gibson around. Okay. Do you want to hear about this, Mike? I would love nothing more. So about the time that this double-neck bass guitar instrument was introduced, 74, Ibanez had started thinking, oh, you know, we should come up with some original designs. Mm -hmm. Some stuff of our own instead of copying the Gibsons and the Fenders and the Martins and all the stuff that they were doing. In 1975, they introduced the Iceman. We all know that one. Mm -hmm. In 1976, they go to Nam. And they've got the Iceman, but they've also got a lot of these copy things. Gibson goes over to the Ibanez booth, and they kind of take note. Look at all of our shit they're copying. Sure. Rumors start flying all around. You might want to watch out. They're going to sue you. So in a kind of great preemptive move in 1977, they show up to Nam. this is Ibanez, with all original designs. They just accelerated their idea of wanting to have new guitars and populated their entire booth with it. Because they had heard the rumor that Gibson was planning on showing up at Nam in 1977 and confiscating their whole booth. Oh. <laughs> Gibson shows up and there's not a copy in sight. That's a bold move. I love that. That's crazy. Yeah, they were going to confiscate all of it. So when the lawsuit came down, though, was it like, hey, you did this three years ago. You owe us money. It was filed in 1977, same year. Okay. In Philadelphia Federal Court. You can imagine Gibson saying, they're copying all our shit. And then Ibanez is like, no, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty great. The guitar you're holding is what, like 76? The year of this one is 77. This is the year of the lawsuit. Oh. But you can uh... see, look what they did with the headstock. Oh, my God. It's the Ibanez headstock. Not open book. Have you seen the pictures of this thing, Mike? Yes. I think that it's glorious. It's rad, but it looks like that SG double neck model. Right. It doesn't have the open book headstock. Yeah. I guess the pickups are a little weird. The pickups on the guitar side are Super 70s. That's an Ibanez creation. Yeah. And on the bass side, they're high gain pickups. I suspect the bridge one has been replaced. It doesn't really look like an Ibanez one. Did you hear when John said the pickups are high gain? Did you hear that, Mike? (laughs) That was a nice little subtle plug. That's the name of this podcast. (laughs) Whenever that gets mentioned, I get really excited. How am I doing, Mike? Wonderfully. Okay. (laughs) I think we're going to put Ed and subsequently Mike on the spot here. Oh, yeah. Oh. This thing comes out in 1974. Mm -hmm. Two necks. Twice the guitar. Twice the guitar. Yeah. How much in Watergate dollars Yeah. would this thing have been brand new? Get your number, keep it in your head, Ed, while you're thinking about that. Yeah. What do you think, Mike? $1974. What would this thing have cost you? Gas crisis is going on. Oh, We are yeah. in the middle of rampant inflation. Are you talking about now? <laughs> Isn't that crazy? <laughs> I gotta say, this is one of my favorite segments. Yeah? Yeah. I love this sort of Price is Right vibe that you guys do here. It is humbling for me. Man, when Frank came on and first time nailed it within like... To the dollar. He's a professional. Exactly. Are you a professional, Mike Squires? I'm going to write mine down so John can see that I don't change it once you throw your number out. Ooh. Okay. Uh, We want to remember that this is a bolt-on. Yes. And it was an import, so their whole thing was undercutting Gibson. So I'm gonna guess four seventy nine. Four seventy nine from Mike Squires. Yeah. 
What is your number? Man, you were talking and I was just like, I went way too high the whole time you were talking. You already wrote it down. And there's my number. Ed went 689. Mr. Squires wins. <laughs> What? It was four fifty three. Holy shit. Wow. On Price is Right, I would have been too high. You were way closer than me. Yeah. Congrats, Mike. Yeah. Congrats. Thank you so much. He knows what's up. Yeah, yeah. Come on. Today dollars, anybody? Oh. Eighteen hundred bucks? Fourteen? Twenty six hundred bucks. Oh my god. Whoa. I'm terrible at this fucking game. This one was painful for me. Yeah. The only price list I could find was from Germany. Wow. <laughs> and then you had to convert it. It was in Deutschmarks. <laughs> okay, I can find out what the exchange rate was. Oh crap. Then they went from the Deutschmark to the Euro. Right. Fuck. You had to do a bunch of math. The dogged research <laughs> that people have come to expect, yes. Wow. It's reflective of your commitment to excellence. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You gotta try it. Try and decide. If you say hello or goodbye, goodbye or goodbye. Mike, would you buy this thing? This is a part of the podcast that I have so many questions about because it's just like this blank canvas. Would you buy it or not? Yeah. Is it at a pawn shop? Is it 200 bucks? Are we talking about an imaginary world where I'm a billionaire and money doesn't matter? We go around and around about this all the time. We should say that superfan Dylan loaned us this guitar. This comes from the personal collection of one of our viewers. But yeah, we have that same argument. Would I right now add this specific instrument to my collection? Or are we talking, would I recommend to the average person that they might like to have one of these? It can be anything. It's almost like any guitar I would love to have. Sure. But I approach it like I have limited funds and I have limited space for guitars. So I almost kind of think, would I sell one of my guitars to buy this thing? That's how I approach it. What do you think? For me, conceptually, this is a buy. But in reality, I think that it's a deny. I think it's a really cool guitar. Also, I think that this is an era of collectible instrument. Mm -hmm. It's probably priced higher than I'm willing to go. All you have to do is put lawsuit on something and the price goes up 500 bucks. Right. I've owned some of these old Ibanez and Greco instruments and they're great, but I'm a deny even though I really like it. He's going to deny it. I think you played the game exactly correctly. Your thought process maps to how I think about these things as well. You're a deny also? I'm a deny, I think for different reasons though. John is sitting there, he's been holding on to this guitar for four hours now that we've been <laughs> recording. <laughs> and he just looks more uncomfortable than I have ever seen him yes. with an instrument in his lap. Yes, it is pretty uncomfortable. It's just not my thing. Yeah, I think I have to go deny also. Yeah. I think it's fun to play around with, but I'll pass. This is almost certainly the first triple deny. Really? Yeah. You have been in a lot of bands, and then you have the couch riffs thing. It feels like, to me, you have a reputation like, oh yeah, let's get Mike because everyone wants to hang out with Mike. What kind of a hang are you? Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm a better hang now than ever before, but I hate mm. to burst your bubble. I don't know if until recently I've ever been actually invited to join a band. I have invited myself to join every band that I've been in. <laughs> <laughs> and the way it happens is I hear that a band needs someone and I learn all their songs and then I say, hey, I can do that. And they almost always dismiss me at first. And uh, I say, no, really. You toured with and played <laughs> on Harvey Danger? Yeah. I heard they needed a guitar player because their second record had a bunch of extra guitar parts and they were a one guitarist band. And I basically cornered them at the Crocodile and said, hey, I'm your guy. That's so great. And they were you know, terrified by my forwardness. <laughs> <laughs> I'm your guy. Let's go. Let's do it. 
interview's over. Yeah, basically. Maybe it's the couch riffs thing where you just have so many cool, rad people. It just seems like the only reason those people would agree to do it is because there's a cool, rad host, is my impression. Well, that's kind of you to say thank you. Maybe it's starting to become that, but the way it's developed and come together, it's just me relentlessly pummeling people. (laughs) (laughs) Just relentless, you know? Someone's like, well, I'm kind of busy right now. Okay, well, I'll just try back next week. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's great. Until someone says, hey, uh, not my vibe, I will persist. Yeah. Don't they know that you make coffee? I know, that's what I say. Don't you know I live near a waterfall? (laughs) You're kind of multi-instrumentalist, yeah? Yeah, accidentally. I never wanted to be a bass player. Right. Now I love it. Sometimes I even prefer it. But when I moved to Seattle, I couldn't get a guitar gig because I did not look cool. I was fresh out of the Marine Corps. You know, I had a Marine Corps haircut. I played a Jackson. It was 1993. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I wanted to be in Helmet. Hell yeah. Yeah, but everyone was grunging. They didn't want me. I actually had a door closed on me once when I showed up for an audition. (laughs) They opened the door. I was like, hey, and they just said, nope, and closed the door. Wow. But I met some guys. They needed a bass player. I lied, and I said, oh, yeah, I play the bass. Sure. Earlier, I heard a dog. Did I hear a dog in your house? Oh, yeah. Talk to me about your dog. What kind of dog is it? We've got two dogs here. We have Rosie Dog, Ramblin' Rose. Oh. Rose is like a 37-pound Black Lab Beagle mix. What's the dominant dog there? Is it the Beagle or the Lab? Well, she's like Beagle-sized, but she's very athletic. She can jump really high. Shorter legs? She's a kind of a Mary Lou Retton build. Muscular <laughs> compact gymnast you nailed our target audience with the mary lou retton reference (laughs) that's great she used to try and go after birds and i would always tell her rosie you're never gonna get a bird you should just give up and then she fucking caught a bird hell yeah rosie she caught a bird right out of the air you guys whoa she jumped and caught a bird out of the air rosie this bird was not exercising the appropriate caution because it underestimated Rosie just like I did. Who's Rosie's partner? That's Mr. Big. And Mr. Big is like a 15 pound (laughs) miniature dachshund Jack Russell mix. He loves to cuddle, but he's also very independent. Does he catch rats? No, he's a big mouth, so he cannot sneak up on anything. (laughs) He gets stoked. He sees something, he's like, I'm coming for you, motherfucker! (laughs) And then they see him 50 feet away, you know, and they get away. There have only been a few guests we've had on in the COVID times where we've brought in the dog talk. And I think dog talk is super important because... The one thing with COVID is spending more time with the animals. I have loved it. I think animals are the savior of lockdown. When my dogs aren't around, I miss them. Exactly. This podcast, we are going all over the place. Yeah. Let's go a different place. Okay. Mike, you just released Mike Squires number two. This is a little unusual and different. Our viewers will like to know. We've got some we'd like to play, but can you explain how this came about? Well, it's called Number Two Record, but it's my first record. Oh. (laughs) Seems perfect. Number One Record was taken, of course, by Big Star. And so I thought, well, I guess Number Two is first place runner-up, and that's good enough for me. Also, it's a poop joke. (laughs) It is absolutely, positively a poop joke. It's an art project, more or less, but it's it's art. (laughs) I started by just learning some songs and picking on the guitar and then posting them on Instagram stories. And it became increasingly difficult and frustrating for me to edit those things so that they were exactly 15 seconds long. Yeah. And I just thought, I'm going to just write 15 second songs and post those. So you can still find all the original versions of these songs on my Instagram feed. It was fun. And I thought, you know, maybe I'll make a record out of this. A record of 15-second songs. That would be my very first solo record. And that seems like a terrible idea. If it's an idea that no one else would follow through on, that's usually a pretty good indicator that it's something that I will follow through on. 
<laughs> That's great. Yeah. <laughs> there is a funny thing with those 15 second songs. They are songs. There's a beginning, middle, and end. Uh-huh. Working within that box of 15 seconds to get a hook in here and have it be an earworm, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Then you pressed them all onto a flexi disc and put it in a book. That's right. You know, I had a lot of time to think. I drive a lot for work. I'm just thinking, thinking, thinking. So I have a lot of opportunity to over-conceptualize. And we've sort of already established the more ridiculous a concept is, the more prone to following through on that I am. And so (laughs) I thought, all right, it's going to be called number two record. It's a poop joke. Just a state of affairs in the music industry. Music is kind of treated like shit. And I want to put something out that you can play on a turntable. But if you talk to someone who owns a record store, they're like, we sell more records than ever, you know, but sometimes we buy records back from people and they're not even opened. Also, streaming is at an all time high. I knew I didn't want to put this on streaming. So I decided, all right, if no one's going to listen to it, but I want to have something you can play, why don't I just treat it in the worst possible way? And I'll put it on a flexi disc. (laughs) And then if you buy that, you can stream it on Bandcamp. And then the last element of the concept was that I wanted to treat it like a product, just product X is kind of how I referred to it. Treat it like a business person and not an artist or a creator or a musician or whatever. And so I was like, all right, well, if I had a product and I want to put it in Walmart, I would produce it in the cheapest way possible. And then you want to overpackage it. So how would you overpackage a flexi disc? And I started thinking about those flexi discs in magazines, and I thought, oh, a book. Yeah, yeah. And then the book will basically be an Instagram feed come to life. If the internet dies, look at this. Here's an Instagram feed for number two record. So there's an image for every song, and then the lyrics, and then an unnecessarily long explanation, usually, about what the song is about which is my version of oversharing on social media, which is something I don't do unless it's music related. And then the whole thing comes in a wonderfully printed box. That was an afterthought. I was waiting for the books to come back from press. They're eight inches by eight inches. So they're too big for you to put in with your seven inch records. (laughs) This is by design and too awkward to put on your bookshelf. I wanted it to be left out. Like you have to engage with it. That's great. Yeah. The problem that you run into is you put all this work into this box and then what you're going to mail it in some sort of padded envelope mailer and have it get dog-eared on the way? Hell no. So I had a box printed that just looks like a little custom-sized pizza box. So these things are made for the book. It's wonderful. And the illustrations we should mention were done by our man, Matthew Southworth. Yeah. Yeah. Friend of the show, previous guest. He did all of the illustrations. He's really good. Yeah. Should we hear some? Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. This one is the one I made the video for, Ed. Okay. And I chose it because it's called Colorblind, and I know that Ed is colorblind. Ed Peterson is colorblind. Me too. Two colorblind people. Okay, well, this is colorblind off number two record. There it is. <laughs> I love it. Ed, can I tell you a funny colorblind story? Oh, yeah, I'm ready. Colorblindness is the gift that keeps giving, right? <laughs> For sure. <laughs> This is an experience that just happened yesterday. So I'm building a pedal board for this tour that I'm about to do. And, you know, I'm always thinking like, how am I going to do this better than I've done it before? And blah, blah, blah. So I bought this little pedal. It's a two loop pedal, right? Yeah. There's an in and out and two effects loops on it. And there's two switches. Yep. Makes pretty good sense, right? Uh Uh-huh. Sure. So I hooked it all up and I was having a hard time making it work. I would push one of the loops on. It wasn't happening. And then it occurred to me what was going on. And you're going to fucking hate this, Ed. One switch turned the effects loop on and on. And that was an on-off light. The other one selected between the two loops. Uh Uh-huh. And it's red-green. Exactly. What kind of fucking (laughs) asshole? You get two loops and two switches. Why complicate it? (laughs) 
One turns one on and the other one turns the other one on, you fucking asshole. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no. Look, Joe, this one turns the whole thing on and off. And this other one, we're going to be like a selector. Huh? Here's another one, Ed. Okay. This is called Life Lesson Number One. Okay. Life will teach you lessons if you listen. Like number one, take your shirt off when you photograph with kids so you'll regret it for the rest of your life. (laughs) Have you had your picture taken with kiss with your shirt off? No, I had my photograph taken with Kiss with my shirt on. Oh. Oh, and you regret it? Yeah. It was an instant regret. I walked away from the photograph before I even saw it. I just felt like a real heel. I was the only one without my chest showing. Oh, no. What was I thinking? Shirt shame. Yeah, yeah. You got some tremolo going. That's a spun loud shook sand fuzz. With With. uh, Strymon Flint in tremolo mode. Love the Flint. What happens if you play bass with the tremolo? Oh. Oh. That sounds pretty great. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Another one, Ed? You want to hear another one? Yeah, yeah. This is You Can Learn from Steve Jones. Okay. There you go. (laughs) Nailed it. That's it. Absolutely nailed it. They're all very derivative. Like this song, I definitely sat down and was like, all right, I'm going to write a song about Steve Jones. Right. I had read his book and I thought, oh, I'll make it sound like The Clash because he said he wished that he could have joined The Clash. Oh. But, you know, this one still kind of came across more like a Sex Pistols. Yeah. Where do people go, Mike, to get number two record? I'm glad you asked. (laughs) (laughs) Because I would have forgotten to even mention it, to be honest. The only place that I've made this available is on Bandcamp. I like Bandcamp's politics. I like their policies. I like how they treat artists. And it's been a pleasure to sell my stuff there. So Bandcamp, search for The Mike Squires. There's another Mike Squires out there. That's why if you look at my Instagram, it says Mike Squires, not Mike Squires. (laughs) <laughs> There's a young guy who's like a hip hop producer yep. in Connecticut, and his name is Mike Squires. Yeah. But you'll know because you'll see an illustration, my album's cover, with me nude on a horse. It's just a ripoff of Fleetwood Mac's then play on album cover. Got it. I thought it would be great to have that as a painting. Yeah. Hey, Mike, how did we do today? How do you think we did? I think you guys are the greatest. I listen to the podcast every week, I told you. That's not lip service. (laughs) Oh, my God. Well, I never miss a Couch Riffs video. I just don't. Exactly. Okay, so Couch Riffs on YouTube. Yep. The Mike Squires on Instagram. Is that what that was? That's it. And Mike Squires on Bandcamp to buy yourself number two record. Number two record. Mike's got everything going on. Oh, yeah. You kidding? (laughs) What do we got going on? Oh, we've got Instagram, too. The high end. We've mm-hmm. got a web page. We've covered the socials. We should also shout out our man Dan DeMay over there at Spun Loud Effects for sending us this Shook Sand Fuzz. And we should say, viewers, that it is available this Friday. This Friday. So after the episode drops. Yeah. SpunLoud.com. Mike, I got to thank you so much for showing up and putting up with, well, us. The door is always open, Mike. Come on by. You guys, thank you so much for having me. It was one of my life's pleasures to be a guest on this podcast because I am such a fan. Oh, thank you very much. I always learn stuff listening to the podcast. The plan is working, Ed. People are going around repeating our half-assed facts. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Learn stuff. (laughs) You hear stuff. And we say it authoritatively. And then you repeat it. Yeah. Mission accomplished. Yeah. Ed, do you want to come back and do it again sometime? Let's do it again in just a couple days. Okay, let's do it again in a couple days. Okay, bye. Okay, bye, Mike Squires. Goodbye, fellas. 